Welcome to the Salk Institute's Where Cures Begin podcast, where scientists talk about breakthrough discoveries with your hosts, Ali Akmal and Brittany Fair. I am here with Dr. Emily Manukian. Dr. Manukian is a postdoctoral fellow in the lab of Dr. Sachin Panda, where she studies chronobiology. So Dr. Manoogian, what is chronobiology? Great question. So chronobiology is really just studying the timing of biology. So chrono being time and then biology being biology. So we're really just studying the timing of everything. Chronobiology as a field is very broad. It ranges from people studying many different model organisms. So everything from a single cell bacteria to marine life, to mammals, to humans. Um, everything has a circadian clock. I mean, even plants. That's, that's actually a pretty big field. That's where it was originally discovered. So does this mean that everything in this world is on some kind of clock? As far as we know, the hypothesis is that every living thing has a clock. Um, for a while, it was thought that extremophiles, like these bacteria that can live in these like super extreme environments that really don't have daily rhythms in the environment, did not have rhythms, but even then there's been some uh, data to suggest they have different types of rhythms, but they do exist. And the idea is that we've all, all organisms have created a way to adjust to this 24 hour cycle in environmental changes. So it's really a way of preparing your body for what it needs to do and anticipate what it needs. And so regardless of what kind of organism you are, you still need to anticipate that environmental change. And what do you mean by circadian clock? Yeah, so circadian is just Latin for about a day. So circa is about, dian is day. That is one example of a biological rhythm. Um, there are others, um, obviously. So we have circ annual rhythms would be a yearly rhythm. Um, we have these you know, tidal rhythms. We have you know monthly rhythms. We even have ultradian rhythms, which are shorter than 24 hours. Um, they're still usually in... Uh, factors that would multiply to 24, but not always. And as science is progressing, there's been more and more studies, so there might be these kind of micro rhythms that then result in larger rhythms, so that these really short scale. Um, so there's many different kinds. Um, frequently, you hear about circadian rhythms, because that is that 24-hour oscillation that is really adapting to the environment. But those other rhythms are also very important and can be very insightful. When you speak about circadian rhythms, it makes me think of the sleep-wake cycle. Yeah, so sleep-wake cycles is one example of kind of a circadian output, right? So if we think about circadian behavior, sleep and activity is the easiest thing to relate to because we all sleep, we all get up. (laughs) Um, Generally, we have a a pattern to that. Um, But there's actually rhythms in all kinds of behaviors. So sleep is not the only one. So what are some other examples? Yeah, so pretty much any behavior. So um, mood actually oscillates throughout the day. Even your cognitive ability oscillates throughout the day. In fact, there was a study I think that came out last year um, said they had 73 different personality traits that fluctuated across the day. That's fascinating. Most people tend to be the most cognitively able around 10 in the morning, depending on when you get up. It could be a little earlier or later on your own schedule, but morning is typically you're most kind of alert and cognitively able. There's been some interesting things too, kind of anecdotally, that people are best at editing things at night. Um, And just your rational abilities change throughout the day. So there's all kinds of things like that. Um, When we think about more direct physiological behaviors, um, aside from sleep-wake, like when we eat, when we run, when we, you know, when we're active, all these things, or even social interactions, like are we gonna have a really, you know, intense conversation. All of those things are influenced by the clock and also feed back on the clock to give it cues about what time of day it is. So do you try and schedule your meetings around 10 a.m. every day? (laughs) No. (laughs) (laughs) I need my cognitive abilities for whatever's happening then. Um, And it it depends on the person, right? Um, There's definitely different types of, you know, everyone has their own circadian clock. Everyone has a slightly different phase, so their relationship of, you know, my 10 a.m., quote, unquote, 10 a.m., my, you know, best cognitive performance is probably different than someone else's. Um, so it's all relative. Even physically, like, you have um, your greatest muscle strength in the afternoon, but you have, you know, 
different skills at different times of day. So physically, mentally, you're really just a different person at different times of day. I think that's so interesting because I'm currently training for a triathlon and I've heard that 4 p.m. is the best time to work out, but I had no idea why. (laughs) Yeah. So you actually do have higher muscle strength. Again, I don't like using exact clock hours, Mm -hmm. like time on a clock, because if you're a morning person, you wake up at 6 a.m. versus someone who wakes up at 10 a.m., that 4 p.m. is a very different number for those people. But generally in the late afternoon, Um, is you have your peak muscle performance. And it also changes your blood pressure. So depending on what you're going for, you can kind of push yourself in different ways at different times of day. That's very helpful to know. And how does the timing of when we eat affect our body? Now, light is the biggest cue to tell that clock in your brain the time of day that it is. And so light is super important to get right um, and is really the easiest way to reset behavior, especially shown in animal models. But we also know it's really potent in humans. The problem is, is all those other clocks throughout your body are actually more sensitive to nutrient cues than they are to light. They're only going to get that light cue kind of downstream from the clock in your brain. But if you change nutrient availability, they respond instantly. Um, And so food is a huge cue to pretty much all of your body to tell it this is kind of the time of day that it is. If it's eating, it's assuming that it's during your active phase. If you're eating at the same kind of time of day, during an act, you know, your normal daytime, within a reasonable interval, it's a great way to support your circadian system and say this is the time of day that it is. And it's kind of this positive feedback to say we're, we're on time, this is what's going on, and it's reinforcing that. When we eat super early or super late or middle of the night or just even high variability in the times that we eat, it's really a very inconsistent cue. Um, And it's kind of trying to reset the clock all the time. And then, So how can we best biohack this system? Yeah, so that's a great question. Uh, That's what all of our research is focusing on right now. You know, the big thing is obviously what you're eating and how much you're eating is absolutely important. Um, Our line of research has, you know, and many other people in the field have shown that when you eat is also really important. So there's a few aspects to it. First is variability. So trying to have regular eating times, especially the first meal and the last meal, um, try to be more regular. There is a good amount of evidence out there, and I think it's growing, that having really variable, you know, switching your breakfast time by more than an hour is associated with some negative consequences. So keeping it regular, and that's every day of the week not just weekdays versus weekends. (laughs) Good Um, to know. (laughs) uh, There's also a good amount of evidence saying to have most of your calories in the first half of your day. So having really small breakfast or lunch and then binge eating a dinner has been associated with a lot of different um, health, negative health consequences. Um, So the whole saying of like, eat breakfast like a king, you know, lunch like a prince, dinner like a pauper, I think actually might have some scientific backing to it. And our research suggests that eating, you know, that duration should absolutely be shorter than 12 hours a day. When we do interventions, we put people on a 10 hour duration. So for instance, 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. or 9 p.m. to 7 p.m. And if you consolidate everything into that period, you're allowing for two things. One, you're giving your body those nutrient cues when you're absolutely when you're active phase and not when you're about to fall asleep. Secondly, you're allowing for a daily 14 hour fast. Um, And sometimes people hear the word fasting and they go, oh, that's an extreme thing. But no, it just means you're not eating. You're not taking in calories at that time. We kind of think of the digestive system as as a road. Um, If you need to fill in potholes or reline things, you need to get the cars off the street (laughs) and you need a chance to do that. This sounds easy for someone like me who has basically a nine to five. But what about someone who does more shift work or someone who has an abnormal schedule like a flight attendant? How can they use this to their advantage? Great question. It absolutely depends on your schedule for how easy this would be to adopt. There's some people that are like, this is the easiest thing in the world. How can everyone not do this? And there's others that's like, look, this is impossible. We are currently working with San Diego Fire Department to test out um, time-restricted eating. But even there, we have it a little bit easier than some because they're on a 24-hour shift. So their day is still their day and they're used to having most of their meals during the day and being active during the day. And although they'll have to wake up and go on a call, they're not usually staying up in between those calls, unlike maybe a doctor or a nurse that would be on the night shift and they're, you know, 
they're you actively know, working, working the whole time that they're awake at night or yeah. anyone that does night shifts, right? Police, I mean, I could go on. Shift sure. work is extremely common, unfortunately. I mean, we need them, but it's, it's hard. And you have a current study going on called My Circadian Clock. Yeah, so My Circadian Clock is actually a tool that we use in a lot of studies. Um, it is available worldwide for anyone to download. Download like on a phone? Yeah, so it is a smartphone app. It was developed in Sachin's lab, but really it's a tool for logging food. One of the problems is if you go back to all the traditional kind of nutrition logging, it never included the timing of food. To get this data, uh, the app locks in a timestamp, and then we can actually assess when are people taking in calories? When are you eating? The way it's set up, um, it's a two week kind of baseline. What is your current lifestyle? We just wanna know what is, what is your eating pattern? And even if that's all that you do, that's super interesting because understanding eating pattern in different parts of the world is something that really needs to be done. And then after that, you can set your own goals. So if you see that you have a 16 hour eating window, I wouldn't jump to 10, I would say, okay, Let's go down to 12 or 14 even. Get your body comfortable there. Let's go down to 11 or 12 now, and then maybe go down to 10 or 11. If you're interested in tracking your weight, then you can add everything that you're eating, you know, get that eating pattern in there, and then update your weight frequently. If you're interested in looking at how your blood pressure might change, you can add your blood pressure. In fact, you can add pretty much anything you'd get tested at a normal doctor's office or a blood test. Um, so you can keep track of things that are interesting to you. So if you're interested in signing up for the My Circadian Clock app, um, you can visit us at www.mycircadianclock.org um, and you can sign up there. I'm very curious to see where this research leads you. How long will you be collecting data from this app? We are planning on collecting data for a long time. Um, we have a lot of collaborations going with um, experts in different fields that are interested in applying, you know, time-restricted eating and understanding eating patterns in different ways. You know, there is this really cool paper that just came out looking at where you are within a time zone and the effect that that might have if you're on the west side of a time zone versus east side of a time zone. Um, and some very large countries like China don't have different time zones, right? So your people in different areas are getting much different exposure to light. And so when they eat on, you know, a clock time when they eat might be physically very different than someone else eating at that same time. We see similar things in Spain when they, they're, the light that they get is actually a bit delayed. So everyone says they eat so late and yes, they do, Sure. but it's actually not quite as extreme as you think when you adjust for the t difference in the timing of light. Um, so understanding that in many different ways, we need to keep the app going for a long time so we can get enough people to be able to analyze that properly. Well, it's just so fascinating too, because I feel like we've always looked at what you eat, not when? I think it, it is important to note that many cultures that have fasting as part of their religion, there's, you know, all kinds of different advice that we get from family members. And it really, if you go back to it, you know, like the Buddhist cultures had fasting periods, the, you know, Hinduism has fasting, there's Ramadan. I mean, there's all these different historical pieces of society that have influenced how we eat. I think now is the first time where it's kind of come from more of a basic science point of view. Um, but we shouldn't act like we're the first ones to think of this ever because sure. we're not. You know, it's, it's been part of human culture for hundreds of years. But now I think this is the first time we're trying to analyze it in a scientific way and do controlled clinical trials to find out what the optimal uh, eating pattern is and really try to roll it out in a big way. And the fact that now it's, you know, we can do this kind of citizen science where we can you know, put out an app that anyone in the world can use and collect data on really large scales. I mean, that's something that we can only do now because of technological advances. Well, and also, I mean, you're not just looking at, you know, what time period is bad for you. You're looking at what is the ideal time period? What's, you know, what keeps someone in health, which I think is an approach yeah. that people tend to not take. They really are looking at, you know, what goes wrong in disease. So that's an interesting side to the story as well. Especially like in the firefighter trial, it is more of a prevention as well. Is it something that's feasible? Is it something that you can live with that it could potentially help you long term? So I think this will be a, a very rapidly growing field. I'm even within the past year, the number of studies that have been posted on clinicaltrials.gov, I mean, have just skyrocketed.
And what are some of the clinical implications for diseases such as obesity or diabetes? So those are the most exciting, I think. Um, so I don't see this as a weight loss diet. I see time-restricted eating as part of what a healthy lifestyle means. In the human trials that have been done, um, on average, time-restricted eating leads somewhere between 35 to 5% weight loss without people changing their diet. But what's more exciting and where we actually see bigger differences is in some of these other cardiometabolic outputs. So we just finished a pilot study that's under review right now um, where we had individuals do a 10-hour uh, time-restricted eating window for 12 weeks. Um, and these were individuals that had metabolic syndrome. So they're at high risk for diabetes. They're at high risk for cardiovascular diseases. So they tend to have elevated uh, cholesterol, elevated blood pressure, and they tend to be overweight. Um, and some of them also have elevated glucose levels. And what we found is kind of improvements across the board. So those that had elevated glucose before they started had significant decreases in their HbA1c, which is kind of this average measure of glucose. And that was really exciting to see an improvement of that. And so we're seeing these kind of widespread cardiometabolic benefits. Um, and it's not just us. Other groups that have tested eight-hour eating intervals and even a six-hour eating interval, which is a little extreme, but um, they've also shown similar improvements in glucose regulation and uh, cardiovascular health. How could this possibly be related to cancer? Yeah, cancer's interesting. Cancer cells can have different rhythms than your healthy cells. No way. Yeah. So they can be out of phase with each other. So there are certain cancers where this is really effective, where if you can identify the phase of the cancer cell and target that with chemotherapy while they're dividing and your healthy cells aren't, it can be much more effective and have very few side effects. So I'm really interested in learning how you got into this field. <laughs> I mean, were you always fascinated by circadian rhythms? No, I mean, who knows about circadian <laughs> rhythms as a kid? When you're near five, you're not like, I'm going to be a chronobiologist. And someone would be like, what is that? Yeah, how did you even <laughs> learn that chronobiology <laughs> was, was a, a thing. field? Yeah. yeah, I didn't learn it till I was, um, I was my, a sophomore in college. And I took a class called Hormones and Behavior um, with Lance Kriegsfeld at UC Berkeley. Yeah, I fell in love with the class. There's this big overlap, actually, between neuroendocrinologists and chronobiologists because it, you know, a big part of chronobiology is seasonal reproduction and how does the circ annual rhythm play into all these other things. And so that's actually how I got interested in it. And I just love the class. And then he had a second class called biological clocks and I took that and that was how I got into chronobiology. So what is your favorite part about <laughs> being a chronobiologist? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I think it's just that it, it's this kind of secret system that most people don't really know about and it's it really affects everything and it it sounds like this really overstatement to say that chronobiology affects you know every other aspect of biology but it's very hard to find something that is you know kind of separate from it it's like this core pillar of physiology that everyone kind of ignores circadian system can be such a great supportive piece of health um, and it can also be very easily disrupted and so I think it's a really interesting intervention point where there are completely free non-invasive things that we can do like getting light at the right time of day eating at the right time of day trying to have regular sleeping patterns exercising at the right time of day that seem very simple and you know these little things but can have really huge impacts on health but I just think it's this really kind of beautifully intricate part of physiology that isn't fully appreciated yet. So do you have any advice for an aspiring chronobiologist? Uh, do it. <laughs> um, no, it's a, it's a great field. Um, you could say, do it, but at the right time. Do it at the right time. <laughs> no, now's actually a great time, I think, to join chronobiology. You know, so last year, the Nobel Prize went to um, a group of chronobiologists for the first time. Yeah. It's really expanded dramatically in the past 50 years and so now is an amazing time to join the field because there is so much of a a beautiful kind of laid down structure but there's so much more to understand and it's really not just a field of chronobiology it's there are chrono chronobiological aspects to any field right so it really is expanding into a lot of different things. People within the field are really great and supportive. Um, and so I've really enjoyed growing up within that field. And so I think it's a, it's a good group to be a part of. Well, thank you so much for being here today. It was 
fascinating to learn about the field of chronobiology and to learn more about your specific work and your current study. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Join us next time for more cutting-edge Salk science. At Salk, world-renowned scientists work together to explore big, bold ideas. From cancer to Alzheimer's, aging to climate change. Where Cures Begin is a production of the Salk Institute's Office of Communications. To learn more about the research discussed today, visit salk.edu slash podcast.